of is specifically the processes that happen in the nephron, which is a continuation of the functions of the kidney since the nephron is part of your kidney. So we're realistically still focused on the first function of your kidney, the idea that it filters waste. So, the processes that occur in the nephron would start with filtration. So we already know a little bit about filtration, about where it's happening. Sometimes instead of just calling it filtration, we call it force filtration because it's not really a passive process. Things aren't just falling out of your blood. Your blood pressure that you have in the glomerulus is what forces some of your blood to pass through the fenestrated capillaries into Bowman's capsule. So like I said earlier, 20%. Now, this is average. This would not be the exact number for every person in the world. But in a typical healthy adult person, about 20% of their blood would be forced out of a blood vessel through the filter into Bowman's capsule. Now to give you an illustration of what that would look like numerically, 600 milliliters would be a typical amount of blood that would flow through your kidney in a minute. Now you have two kidneys, so this would be happening on both sides. That means that if that's the number, 20%, which means I divided by 5, that's how much filtrate was collected. Now here's a spot where a number could actually be the answer. A lot of the times in biology, our numeric response questions are to match things or put things in order or find things on a graph. But this is a spot where, because I'm telling you 20% is the rule, you could actually give me a number as an answer. So you could expect a numeric response question about this 20%. So on the right, there's a little picture showing the same thing we've seen before. This would be your renal artery, or a branch of it. Then you would have the afferent arterial, the glomerulus, and the efferent arterial, indicating that blood is flowing into the glomerulus, some of it gets filtered, and then whatever is left, whatever didn't fit through the filter, continues along through the efferent arterial. And that leads to the capillaries. So that's what's going on with your blood. Now we mentioned briefly before, but here's a repetition, things that should not go through the filter include red blood cells, proteins, and platelets. Platelets are what your blood needs for clotting. So there are other, other tiny blood cells that you have. So these types of cells are too big. They should not pass through the filter from the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule. So if you look here, this would be a red blood cell. That could be a platelet. And the picture's trying to illustrate they can't fit through the little spaces. They're too big. The filtrate would just be the fluid part of your blood. Now I mentioned earlier, if you have red blood cells, in your urine, that would be a strong indication that something is wrong with the filter because now things that are too big are getting through. Having proteins in your urine uh, could very well be uh, 
something that happens when there's too much pressure. So things are getting pushed through the filter that shouldn't fit. Because uh, remember, this is force filtration. So if there's too much pressure, sometimes things get pushed through. Uh, and very frequently, someone who is pregnant or has some situation of pressure in that area would have proteins. Now you'll notice uh, that I didn't mention white blood cells. You might be aware that there's another type of blood cells. White blood cells generally don't spend a lot of time actually in your blood, which is funny since they're called blood cells. They actually spend most of their time in your lymphatic system, which is other vessels you have. If there were white blood cells in urine, it would mean probably that you have an infection. White blood cells we'll talk about quite a bit in the chapter on circulation. But white blood cells come into your blood when you have an infection of some sort or an inflammation. Normally, you don't have a high number of white blood cells uh, in your normal resting state in your actual blood. They're stored other places. White blood cells can be very big, but they can also be very small. And so white blood cells could realistically get through the filter. Uh, now, does anyone want to ask any questions about filtration? So it's filtration, but it's force filtration. Something is pushing things through the filter. If we increase that pressure, uh, then we increase the number of things that are getting pushed through the filter. Now, the second process that is occurring in the nephron is what we call reabsorption. Reabsorption means that things are passing from the filtrate back to the blood. So that direction is important, which way things are moving. Reabsorption is for things that your body does not want to lose. So like I said earlier, in those few hundred milliliters of uh, blood that are filtered, uh, depending on how much blood you have, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 or 120 milliliters actually gets filtered. And only one of that actually forms urine. So it's less than 1%. Now, since this is a really small number, that would be a hard one for me to ask a numeric response about because it's not an official percentage. It's less than one. So what you need to recognize is most of what gets filtered gets taken back. Now, what we'll talk about is the mechanism. How are things getting taken back? The first thing that happens is active transport. Active transport requires the use of ATP. So we know what ATP is. It's a molecule that your cell uses for energy produced during cellular respiration. Active transport requires ATP. Active transport is also usually when substances are being moved against their natural direction of movement. In active transport, we're going to take sodium ions, which we would represent Na positive, for those of you maybe not in chemistry. Glucose, which we know C6H12O6. And amino acids, which we generally wouldn't write the formula for because there's 20 different ones of them. But those three substances are active transported from the filtrate to the blood. Active transport means ATP was necessary, and it means that they are transported against their concentration gradient. So I'll just take a minute here and remind you what concentration gradients mean. Whenever you have two areas, you can compare how much of a substance you have in both of them. If there's a difference, that's called a gradient. So some of you might use the word gradient to, when talking about color. I know that I sometimes, when I'm making a 
PowerPoint or some sort of picture related thing, I'll pick gradient fill and it fills it darker on one side and lighter on the other. A gradient means a difference in concentration between two areas. Now, there are already, or there should already be, glucose in your blood, sodium in your blood, and amino acids in your blood. Your body doesn't want to give those things away. So when we say we're moving molecules against their concentration gradient, it means we're taking them and putting them where there's already a lot of them. Normally, molecules want to spread out. Active transport says, no, we're not going to let you. We're going to force you all to move to one spot. So when we say against their concentration gradient, that is what we mean. So if I take a look at my nephron that I've drawn over here, well, I'm lying. I didn't draw that. I used someone else's drawing of it. Uh, we'll see that a lot of this is happening in the proximal tubule. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, that's where the glucose and the amino acids and some sodium and some water are getting reabsorbed. Someone Siri wants to do bio with us today. Now, because I did that, because we did active transport, in particular of this sodium thing which is positive, things that are negative are attracted to things that are positive. So any negative ions, for example, chloride ions, which would be Cl negative, and bicarbonate, which is HCO3 negative, they follow along. Now, we're not doing anything extra to make them go. This is passive. These molecules would move because of charge attraction. Negative things are attracted to positive things. Now, the third kind of reabsorption is water. And this is probably the most detailed one of the three. Water reabsorption happens because of the first two things. Now, in the water reabsorption, it says that the blood is hypertonic. That means more concentrated. Compared to the filtrate, because I just took a bunch of stuff out of it. I just took all the sodium, all the glucose, all the amino acids I could, and pumped them out of the filtrate back into the blood. Then, these negative ions, chloride and bicarbonate, they left as well. So I just put a whole bunch of substances back into the blood. That means blood is now more concentrated than the filtrate. Now, the fact that one is more concentrated than the other is what a gradient is. So a gradient is simply the difference, the difference in concentration. And the place where the gradient is the highest is at the very tip of the loop of Henle, which is the part that dips down into the medulla. <clears throat> so the loop of Henle dips down. On this picture, there's like some pinkish red shading to show that we've dipped down into the medulla. The medulla is always sort of a darker color, and in real life, it actually is really dark red. Now, when we get to the tip of the loop of Henle, water will move passively by diffusion. And when it's water, we could even use the word osmosis, because that is what the movement of water is. So water will move from the filtrate to the blood to try to equalize this concentration difference. Water is always trying to make everything equal, to try to dilute things so that concentrations are equal. So at this point, the blood will have lots and lots and lots of substances in it. So water will want to move into the blood to dilute all of these substances, making it seem equal. Now, where does this happen? In the tubules, the PCT, the loop of Henle, the DCT. 
So some degree of reabsorption happens everywhere in those tubes. The point that we would want you to specifically know is the tip of the loop of Henle because that's where the gradient is the highest. That's where the most of the water reabsorption is going to happen. The third thing that happens in the nephron is secretion. Secretion is when things go from blood to the filtrate. So secretion is describing your blood trying to add things to your urine to get rid of them. In general, all of these processes of secretion are active. That means they use ATP and they go against the concentration gradient. Now, like I said, we're going from the blood to the filtrate. Pretty specifically, we're going from a capillary to the PCT or the DCT. Those are the two spots where this is really happening. Not a lot of secretion happens in the loop of Henle because it's so focused on reabsorbing water. So if you look over here, we've got some substances where their arrow is pointing towards the nephron instead of away from it. That's indicating that we are putting those substances into the filtrate. And so graphically, that's how it would be represented. Secretion would be arrows going into the nephron. Reabsorption would be arrows coming out. Now, what are the waste products that we would be trying to get rid of? First, it would be the products of deamination. So this will be a little reminder of what deamination is. There could potentially be ammonia, probably not a lot because your body likes to convert that ammonia right away because it's toxic. Urea would definitely be one of them. To get urea, we did ammonia plus CO2 and we got urea. And we would have uric acid. Uric acid is several molecules of urea combined. Uh, another waste product that you might find would be histamines. Uh, if you know what a histamine is, uh, it might be because you take antihistamines, because your histamines bother you. Uh, histamines are substances that aid in your body's reaction uh, in terms of immunity. Uh, and so sometimes people take antihistamines uh, because their histamines are too active and that causes them some distress. The last thing on the list of wastes would be these things that there are in excess. And notice that I circled the word excess. There's a certain amount of hydrogen ions, which we would represent H+, that your body needs to maintain acid-base balance. But if there are too many, if there is an excess, this would be a place that we would get rid of them. Minerals could be a number of things. In my example, uh, K+, which is potassium, would be one. Uh, generally, a mineral is a metal ion, so calcium, potassium, that kind of stuff. If there is an excess of them, this would be the place to get rid of them. And drugs in general, medicinal or otherwise, if there is an excess beyond what your body requires to heal itself, then they would be excreted here. So we have filtration we have reabsorption, and we have secretion. Those are the three main things that are happening in the nephron. All right, uh, so we're on to lesson 13, 14. We're going to focus on the homeostasis part today. And the first thing that we are going to discuss is the 
principle of osmoregulation. Now, the other day, as part of the functions that the kidney performs, osmoregulation was one of them. So here are the details about osmoregulation. On the left, I have the description of ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone. Now, your antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is produced by your pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland is part of your brain. That's where it is coming from. Now, what is your pituitary? It's sort of a little, looks like a little set of testicles, more or less, hanging down from the hypothalamus. It's right in the middle of your brain. Now, the hormone is called antidiuretic. Anti means to oppose something. So antidiuretic hormone is something that is opposing a diuretic. So we need to know what a diuretic is. A diuretic, by definition, is any substance that increases urine volume. You might notice that the word diuretic kind of sounds a lot like diabetic. Uh, people who are diabetic have high urine volumes usually. Uh, but a diuretic is any substance that increases urine volume. So antidiuretic hormone is going against that. It's trying to stop your urine volume from being high. In other words, stop you from losing water. What this hormone does is it increases the permeability of two structures of the nephron, the DCT and the collecting duct, and it makes them more permeable to water, meaning more water can go from the filtrate back into your blood. Now, increasing permeability means we're letting more go through, we're making the cells allow water to come through. We know from our last bit of stuff that the urine is already hypotonic, meaning less concentrated, and the renal medulla uh, is hypertonic, which means more concentrated. So water wants to go from the filtrate to your blood. What ADH does is make uh, the cells in that area and the tubes permeable to let water actually move. The result of ADH, so its overall function, is to decrease urine volume. Now, ADH is something that you would see again if you continue with Bio30. One of the sections in Bio30 is all about hormones. So some of the hormones that we've learned about this year, you would see them again. And ADH is one of them. Now, how does ADH know, like what's the signal? How does your brain know that it's supposed to produce ADH? Well, there are little cells called osmoreceptors. So if you look at the word osmo, kind of sounds like osmosis. If you see that as part of a word, it means water. So an osmoreceptor are little nerve cells, specialized nerve cells, that detect changes in water concentration. So they are detecting water. Osmo water receptor is the detecting part. Now there are receptors right in your brain and then there are other receptors in other areas of the body that send signals to this part. But there are receptors specifically in a part of your brain 
called the hypothalamus. So it's another one of these parts that's in the middle of your brain. So these cells, these nerve cells, detect water concentration. Then they signal the pituitary to produce more ADH whenever blood water concentration decreases. So, osmoreceptors are detecting osmotic pressure. If there is high osmotic pressure, that means that uh, you have less water, like there's high pressure to have more water. And so one of the things that I might ask you in terms of homeostasis would be how does your body respond to changes in water? And that would be an example of homeostasis. Antidiuretic hormone is the thing that would reduce urine volume. Not having antidiuretic hormone would increase urine volume. Now, there are other substances that help or that hinder this process. So before we move on, I'll just mention this diagram that's at the bottom. It's showing that nerve cells are detecting water pressure. There's a neuron that comes from your hypothalamus to your pituitary gland. And then it produces ADH, which acts on your kidneys and on your blood vessels, and results in uh, increased blood pressure because now you have less urine volume. Does anyone want to ask anything here about either ADH or osmoreceptors? So even though we're not focusing on it a lot, if I have less water in my urine, I have to have more water in my blood. So less pee means more blood, essentially. So that means higher blood pressure. So even though blood is not our main focus here, it's still playing a big role in how this is all resolved. Now I have on the left two other substances that would play a role in osmoregulation. One of them helps, one of them doesn't. Uh, the first one is aldosterone. It is a hormone and it is produced by the adrenal cortex so I showed you where your adrenal glands are. They're on the top of your kidneys. And you know that the word cortex means the outside of something. So aldosterone is coming from the outside of your adrenal glands. What does aldosterone do? Well, it doesn't actually affect water directly. It increases sodium reabsorption from more or less all the parts of the nephron. So there's not like a specific spot that it's acting. But because of this, there would be greater water reabsorption. So aldosterone is not directly affecting water. It's affecting sodium. But because water is getting reabsorbed because sodium is there, more sodium reabsorbed means more water. So I like to call this the indirect hormone. It will have the same result as ADH, less water in the urine, more water in the blood, but it's not directly acting on water. The other substance is alcohol. Now, alcohol is the stuff that beer is made out of. In like a year and a half, when you're old enough, you might try your first beer, and then you would know what it is. Uh, but alcohol prevents your brain from doing its job. In the case of osmoregulation, what is happening is that alcohol prevents the part of your brain, the hypothalamus, 
So that's the part where those osmoreceptors are. It prevents that from stimulating your pituitary gland. So you're not getting the message that you do not have enough water in your blood, that your urine volume is too high. Because your brain is not getting the message, ADH doesn't get produced. So even though you are losing water, your brain is not getting the message that you are losing water. This means large volumes of urine and dehydration. Now, side note, as an adult who is a parent of a child, she's three, so I don't have this trouble yet, you can die from dehydration. You can die from dehydration fairly easily, actually, uh, especially when your body doesn't realize that it's dehydrated because you are drinking alcohol and not letting your brain detect that you don't have enough water. So please, do not let yourself get so dehydrated that you would die. Uh, on the right, there's a little diagram which I think illustrates homeostasis very succinctly. So I'm going to go over this diagram because this shows you what happens in your body when you don't have enough water and when you have lots of water. We start at the top with loss of water. So we don't have very much water. You've peed a whole bunch of it out for whatever reason. The result of you losing a lot of water is that you have increased toxicity. What that means is there's less water in your blood to dilute things, so everything seems more concentrated. When that happens, two things occur. ADH gets produced, and you feel thirsty. So when you feel thirsty, that's a direct result of the fact that you've lost water. Now, urine isn't actually the only way you lose water. You lose water through your sweat. You lose water via evaporation. And, and someone like me who spends a lot of their time speaking, I lose a ton of water out of my lungs. So I would need to replace that probably at an even quicker rate. Either one of these two things could be what you tell me on a test happens in response to low water. So you could say ADH is produced or you could say you feel thirsty. Those are both legitimate responses to this. On the ADH side, it causes more absorption of water. We could even add aldosterone over here because both of those substances, uh, directly or not, have the same general effect. You could also tell me that because you're thirsty, you drink more water. So there's two responses that you have. Lose less water and drink more water. And usually they work together to increase water. Once you have a lot of water, then your bodily fluids would be diluted. It's possible to have too much water. Now, I think I mentioned maybe a couple weeks ago, you could die from too much water. There was a contest I heard about people had on the radio, drink water and whoever pees last wins, but the person held it so long, basically things burst and they died. Uh, don't do that to yourself. If you have too much water, everything will be diluted. And the response that your body will have will be to inhibit ADH and to inhibit thirst. So on the top, we're stimulating things. On the bottom, we're inhibiting things. So in terms of homeostasis, your body will respond either by doing something or by stopping something from happening. That's its homeostatic response to water levels. Either of these things will result in loss of water. In other words, higher urine volume. 